Our scripture this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we are continuing um, really this series that we were doing before Easter on what Christians believe. And Easter had a great part of that with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And we're going to talk this morning a little bit more about the resurrection and then continue in this series where we uh, talk about the things uh, in the creed and the things that Christians have always believed, um, things like heaven and hell and the second coming, stuff that often uh, we don't hear a lot about. So uh, I want to encourage you to uh, stay with us through that, through that. I think that'll be helpful and it's not something brand new, but it's, it's neat to study it again and, and uh, hear it again new and, and just realize how powerful the things that Jesus did for us are. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to read that in Romans. <laughs> All right, that looks better. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, in fact, the dead are, if the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ, are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. <clears throat> the Corinthian church had a problem. They had a problem, and it was about the resurrection. They had some, Paul had been there, and he had, he had visited them, as we learned in Acts. And, you know, he, he tells us here what he preached to them. And then he hears that some of them probably were infiltrated by other people who didn't believe in the resurrection, and so some of them kind of bought that. So Paul's writing to kind of straighten them out on this situation. So the whole passage is really about the resurrection, even though he doesn't use that until partway through there. Um, <clears throat> and this basically comes up, breaks down into four pieces. It's number one, introduction, then reasons to believe in the resurrection, then problems of not believing in the resurrection, and then the conclusion that Jesus has been ri risen from the dead. Um, there's a lot we can learn in this, though. <clears throat> um, in writing to them, the Holy Spirit also speaks to us about the resurrection. Uh, number one, the resurrection is the foundation for the gospel message. 
The resurrection is the foundation for the gospel message. Without the resurrection, it just sort of all falls apart. It's also the resurrection, it's also for our faith. And he tells us in verse 2, by it we are saved if we hold firm. Hold firm. He says, otherwise we have believed in vain. If you went through a religious experience and somehow felt the presence of God, but you really didn't believe in the resurrection and hold firm, he said it's in vain. He's basically saying the resurrection is not an optional thing. You know, there's things as Christians that we can disagree with or that different Christians see differently. And uh, there's some biblical tension and passages for both. The resurrection is not one of them. <laughs> it's very clear. And he says, this is, this is foundational. Otherwise, our faith is, is in vain. Number two, and this helps us, <clears throat> it is verifiable. It is verifiable. Paul received it from Jesus when he met him on that road to Damascus, and he passed it on to the Corinthian church. Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. He appeared to Peter, who was still alive at this point. He appeared to the disciples. It says the 12, which is what the disciples were, were called, even though there was only 11 of them, unless maybe they counted Matthias. There's back and forth. But they were kind of known as the, the 12 disciples, who were still alive at the time of this writing. Then he appeared to more than 500 people at the same time. And it actually says 500 brothers, so there's a good chance that it was 500 men and who knows how many women and children. And he says most of these are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. He's basically saying there's 500 people who saw Jesus resurrected after the disciples. Go to ask them. <laughs> Go ask them. They'll tell you what they saw. Now, you know, think about some of the things that we hear reportings of, kind of like Bigfoot. Elvis sightings, you know, those kind of things. One or two people hears them and you talk to them and, you know, they're kind of shaky or you look at some of the pictures and you're not really sure, they're questionable. This is not like that. 500 people all at the same time and they're still alive at this time. And he says, talk to them. He also says that he saw the risen Jesus himself when he appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Number three, all the apostles preached it. <clears throat> this was part of the, the central part of the gospel message. They call it the kerygma, um, which is the content of the preaching. Um, that Jesus lived, or he was born, uh, lived, died, buried, resurrected, and ascended. It's, it's all part of the central core of the apostles' preaching. So all the apostles preached it, and all the Christians believed it. Again, this was not a questionable thing. This was the clear center focus of the gospel message. And you know, number four, through the resurrection, Jesus gives us grace. Jesus gives us grace. Paul says, I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. Now, do you think he's just doing like we do sometimes and putting ourselves down? You ever get in those moods where you say, you know, eh, eh, I just, I'm not so good. And boy, I just, I'm down on myself. This isn't really quite like that. He says, I don't deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Imagine it. Paul killing Christians, then becoming a Christian, then becoming an apostle. And he says, there's no way I deserve this. But by the grace of God, 
I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. And you know, this, this morning we could all say that. We could all find one reason or another to say, I don't, I don't believe to be, I, I don't deserve to be a Christian. I'm never going to be good enough. But by God's grace, I am what I am. And you know, when we look, I don't know how long it was when you ago when you accepted Jesus, but you look at what he's done in your life and we don't deserve it. You know, after you've been a Christian in a while and we live, you know, a, a life for the Lord, we start to get blessings and he rewards. You, you, you plant good seeds, you, you bear good fruit. But even so, it's like without his help, we never would have got there by his grace. And then Paul says something else. He says, his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Paul says, you know, and, and he did. He, I mean, the amount of mileage that he covered on foot to share the gospel, the amount of beatings that he took, and he just never stopped. <clears throat> You know, you ever have those times when you can't sleep, when you feel uncomfortable, the bed just doesn't feel right, it feels hard? Often when that happens, I think about the Apostle Paul. I don't sleep very well when I'm cold. I mean, if my feet get cold, it keeps me awake. I think of the Apostle Paul chained and laying in a dirt floor in the cold. I bet he didn't get much sleep. And he was still healing up often from beatings. I imagine he had arthritis just about everywhere from all the, the beatings that he had. And yet he worked harder than anybody else. And then he says in verse 11, whether then it is I or they, he's talking to the other apostles, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. So he reminds them, goes back and he says, when I talk to you <clears throat> or if they talk to you, no matter where you heard the gospel, this is what you heard. You heard about the resurrection. <clears throat> and this is what you believed. And it's by God's grace. Number five. And this is a real practical one today. Don't let your beliefs get in the way of the truth. Don't let your beliefs get in the way of the truth. <clears throat> Some had the belief at that time that there was no resurrection. Uh, in Jerusalem and from there, the Jews, there were the Pharisees, which we hear quite a bit about, and then there were also the Sadducees. You know the way to remember the difference? The Sadducees did not believe in, the re in any resurrection from the dead. That's why they're sad, you see. <laughs> They're sad, you see, because they don't believe in a resurrection. And that was something that happened way before Jesus came. They had this solid belief, no, there's not a resurrection. Pharisees believed in the resurrection. So there's this ongoing debate among the Jews about, is there a resurrection? Isn't there a resurrection? <clears throat> and other religions as well had their views on, is there a resurrection? They're not even really talking about Jesus so much. They're just denying the resurrection from the start. Well, that belief would get in the way of the truth. And Paul's basically saying, if you don't believe in the resurrection or a resurrection, then you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Don't let your beliefs get in the way of the truth. You know, many of us, or many today, start out with an assumption that's wrong. There are those who start out with the assumption that there is no God. So therefore, how did the world come into existence? They're never going to get the right conclusion because the assumption at the beginning is wrong. <clears throat> many today have this belief that all religions are the same. And you know, and this, you'll hear this a lot. 
no one religion is any better than the other one. You know, you got this and this and this and this and this, and they're pretty much all the same. And a lot of people, that's the foundation that they start with. Well, then you're going to have a problem. Because Jesus was risen from the dead. That makes a difference. That makes Christianity different from any other religion. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't tolerate them and be kind to them and show them the love of Christ. But just means they're wrong, which is a word we're afraid to use anymore. We have an empty tomb and a resurrected Lord. Now, you know, <clears throat> I don't know how many years ago it was that in schools they basically stopped allowing creation to be taught as a scientific option, and they adopted the theory, remember, of evolution. And so from the youngest of times, kids are taught that we evolved from, you know, apes and on down and Darwin's warm pond, and they're taught all this stuff as science. And sometimes when I was teaching college classes, I had, I had some that were science majors, and this is what had been drilled into their head, and it really made, them dif it made it difficult for them to see it any other way. Their beliefs that they had pretty much been brainwashed with by hearing it so many times got in the way of the truth. And you know, if we are descendants of apes and monkeys, even though the missing links are still missing... What does that do to the gospel message? How do you reconcile it? Because if we're descendants just gradually through evolution, there wasn't Adam and Eve an original sin. In fact, the survival of the fittest would say, you know, even the whole concept of sin doesn't make sense. You just do what you got to do to stay alive and, you know, conquer everybody else. And if that's the case, Jesus really didn't need to come. And if he did come, it's kind of in the so what category. So you see how some of these beliefs that we have, these core beliefs, can really mess up our faith in Jesus. <clears throat> but you know what? That's why I am so glad that it's verifiable. Doesn't necessarily mean it's provable. Because provable means that, that kind of depends on the person. And if you've ever tried to convince somebody of something, it usually doesn't work too well. You can prove it six different ways and they're still going to stay with believing what they believe. And, but you know what? There is enough evidence, plenty of evidence for anybody who wants to believe to have a solid researched faith. In fact, lots of people, uh, a couple, you know, that I can think of is Josh McDowell years ago in that. 70s and 80s decided he was going to make an intellectual joke out of Christianity. And so he went to show how foolish it was. He ended up becoming a believer and, writ and wrote several books about the truth of, of the gospel. Uh, more than a carpenter, evidence that demands a verdict. And so there's, there's evidence out there for the Christian faith that's very solid. Now, if you don't want to believe it, you're not going to believe it. You know, you'll find that. <clears throat> but if you do want to believe it, there's plenty there. There's plenty there. And this is just one of them. All of the people who followed the Lord and who, who he appeared to. Um, you know, maybe somebody told you when you, you were growing up, you know, when you die, you just go into the ground and that's it. You heard that one before? Well, if that's essentially the same as what they believed. There is no resurrection. And you know, we are very vulnerable. Maybe you're, you know, I've, I've heard people say, well, my grandpa said, or my grandma said, or my uncle said, or my mom said, or dad said, that you just go into the ground and that's it. And <clears throat> they never really look beyond that. That's going to be a stumbling block. That's going to keep them trapped from believing that Jesus was resurrected and that there's hope in life after death. And 
not just, not just this distant hope, but a very real hope because Jesus was raised. And maybe you were taught, you probably heard this one too, that religion and God are just made up concepts that weak people use as a crutch because they can't handle life. You, you ever hear that one? You know, they're just a concept that people, this is more of a, a psychology thing that you hear some of the psychologists come up with this, that it's just a concept, a figment of our own imagination because it helps us get through life. And, you know, if you believe in a God that's out there to be nice to you and help you, that good for you, you know, and that's, that's it. But they don't believe it has anything to do with reality. Well, when I look at the disciples, I don't see Jesus being much of a crutch. They gave their life for him. Because they believed that he was risen from the dead. You know, maybe you just think it's old-fashioned. That's another thing that you hear. It's kind of, you know, it's said by many we're a post-Christian nation, which I think is definitely true. And many will say, well, you know, that's just old-fashioned. We don't, people don't believe that anymore. But you know what? For 2,000 years, beginning with the disciples and up to today, Christians have believed in the resurrection. And Christians in every century have lost their lives because of their belief in the resurrection. So I don't know what you've been taught <clears throat> or what you've heard or what might be getting in the way of your faith. But you know what? Jesus has been risen from the dead. And Paul lays that out pretty clearly here. And you know, this is the best way to straighten out your belief system. Because I think all of us have been taught stuff by somebody that might sound interesting might sound even makes sense, but it's just not true. But the word of God gives us something solid that we can count on. And Paul anchors all of this in the resurrection. Then number six, we bet our life on it. We bet our life on it. And, you know, I've used that to, with people who have a different perspective than I do. I said, you know what, you can believe whatever you want about God and eternity and religion, because they can, right? But whatever we believe, we bet our life on it. So you better make sure that you've checked it out and that it's right, because it's pretty important. And we look at the disciples here. Early Christians who were alive at the time of Jesus were put to death for their belief in the resurrection. The disciples, every one of them except John, were killed for their belief in Jesus Christ and the resurrection. Can anyone really believe that they would die for a hoax? It doesn't make any sense, does it? Why would you give your life for something that you knew was a hoax. But they knew there was a resurrection, so that's why they could do it. For that matter, why would they even bother giving up their lives and leaving their trades and leaving everything? You know, they could have done that early and then had the hope, and then after Jesus was crucified, without the resurrection, the whole thing would have fizzled out, right? They would have said, well, we thought Jesus was going to be king, and we thought he was something special, and he was just like nobody else. And it would have just, we, you and I would never have heard of Jesus if that was the case. But you know what? They left everything for him because they met him. They saw him resurrected, and they said, if he's resurrected, and he's alive, our sins are forgiven, and he's empowering us, and we better listen to what he says, because he is the only one who conquered death. After Jesus died, they'd have no reason to continue in their faith if they didn't believe in the risen Lord. 
He would have just been another political and religious movement. <clears throat> None of it would make any sense at all. And then Paul takes a little different approach, and he says, okay, if you don't believe in the resurrection, here's what you're missing. He said, without the resurrection, our preaching is useless. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, Paul says, I am wasting my time. He was wasting his time, and I'd be wasting my time. As well as the rest of his ministry and our ministry. If Jesus isn't resurrected from the dead, he said our preaching is useless. And he says your faith is useless and futile. He says this two different times. If you don't believe in the resurrection, what is it that your faith is? He said it's completely useless without the resurrection. Then he takes it a step farther. He says we're liars then. If Jesus is not resurrected from the dead... You're essentially calling us liars because we saw him and we know he was. And so, so you see, it's not just this kind of believe what you want, whatever. Paul says, no. If I'm preaching this and I'm wrong, I'm a liar. Just like C.S. Lewis said that the only logical options for Jesus is that he was either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. Those are the th only three logical options. Because number one, he was a liar if he knew that he wasn't God and pretended to be. Or number two, he was a lunatic who thought he was God, but he wasn't. And you look at those two options, they don't make a lot of sense. Or the only one left is that he really is who he says he is. And he's Lord. And that's kind of what Paul's saying here in a little different words. He says, I'm a liar. We're bearing false witness if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. And then he says, okay, your loved ones who have died, if Jesus didn't resurrect from the dead, they're not going to either. So you lost the hope for them too. Our, the ones who have died, they're lost. And then he says, our hope for eternal life is gone. If Jesus wasn't resurrected, then we're not going to be either. And then he says a statement, um, and this is pretty interesting. I think it's very applicable to, to us today, too. He says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. He's saying, basically, if you're betting your life on Jesus and he wasn't resurrected, and you're just doing it for this life, we're to be most pitied. Now, I will say, receiving Jesus, it's made my life better. How about you? I mean, even for this life, it's made it a lot better. Brought meaning, brought forgiveness, brought all kinds of good things. But Paul still says, if it's only for this life, you're pathetic. You know, if it's only for this life, you're wasting your time. You're of all people to be most pitied. And you know, sometimes we take our eyes off of eternity, don't we? We get so caught up in what's going on in this life. And boy, it goes fast, doesn't it? And it seems like the older we get, the faster it gets, the faster the years move. But compared to eternity, it's such a small thing. And the, the illustration that I, that I like, and there's lots of them out there, but the one that works for me is, they said, you know, if eternity is the whole, the whole sand on the ocean, this life is one grain. This life is one grain. Eternity is all of it. And so he said, if, if, if it's just for this one grain you're living... You're wasting your time. Might make your life a little better, but you're, you're to be most pitied. If our faith is just to make us nicer people, give us better morals, and give us our nice religious warm fuzzy feeling, he says we're pathetic and to be pitied. But you know, Christians from the first disciples all throughout history have believed in the resurrection of Jesus. 
And they've bet their entire lives on it. Many have died for it. And not just then, even recently, we see Christians being killed. We see Christian churches all over the world being a target. And people are still going because he's risen. And we don't need to fear death. When we believe in the same, we believe in the same gospel as they do. And you know, when we believe in the resurrection, we connect with every one of them. We connect back to the disciples because we believe in a resurrection. You know what? Someday we're going to see Paul. We're going to get a chance to talk to him. We're going to see Peter and James and John. Because Jesus was risen and he promises resurrection. And we're going to see those loved ones that have gone before us. Because we live now in the light of the resurrection. I don't know how you apply that to your life. Do you count on resurrection power? You know, we often talk about being people of the cross, following the way of the cross. How about following the way of the resurrection? You know, that should put a spring in your step. That should get you a little bit excited, even if you're tired. The fact that we always have hope. Jesus has been risen. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work within our lives. And you know, we need to remind ourselves of that. Because we forget, don't we? Life takes us away a little bit. But you know, the resurrected king has resurrected us as well. And we know that no matter what happens, if we're believers in him, his resurrection guarantees our resurrection into heaven and we're gonna see him again. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you. Oh Lord, for Paul's reminder because we, like the Corinthians, sometimes just get sidetracked. Lord, we thank you for the resurrection. I pray, Lord, that that truth would soak into our hearts, that it would bring us hope, that no matter what we're going through, we have a resurrected Christ who leads the way, who empowers us. And so, Lord, I pray for each one here this morning, God, that you would... If there's a struggle that they're going through, Lord, I just pray that you would apply the grace of the resurrection to them. Lord, let them see it. Let them see past the struggle and see to your hope and to see, see to your glory. And Lord, I pray that as we go from this place, Lord, that we would be resurrection people. <laughs> Lord, people with that hope in our heart because we know it's true. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name.